So last week, uh, I kind of was just trying to break things down to the idea of just trying to hear music again as a sound and an enjoyable experience and trying to get out of the mindset of everything always having to be like something we analyze or as jazz musicians that we're always trying to get something out of, you know, that there's a thing and that there's a transaction taking place where I'm trying to extract information from this recording to hopefully help my myself and to just try to get back to listening to music for pleasure. And I, I definitely just pick things I liked um, and kind of went at it that way, which I think is how we all kind of start listening to just music, period is we just kind of enjoy it and we enjoy the memories it brings up of the times we listen to it and the things it references in our lives. Um, you know, listening to the Thad Jones track last week, um, just thinking about all the things as I'm listening to it, I'm enjoying the sounds of the band and I'm enjoying the way it's recorded, but I'm also enjoying that I know that Joe Lovano's in that band and I know that Ralph Lalama's in that band. So there's some cultural reference there and contextual reference. And then of course, when Modern Man shows up, it's like, oh, and then Modern Man's here and he's played that music before. And so and so it, it becomes this kind of wide ranging way of listening to music. And in jazz world, we have a very rich tradition, just like I'm sure they do in blues world and rock world and all these kind of things. Um, but today I thought it might be good to work a little bit on in, how can we listen to develop engagement, especially with music we might be less familiar with or music that maybe not isn't directly in our wheelhouse or something like that. And I find engagement, staying engaged, staying focused, um, maintaining concentration to be pretty hard in this day and age. And I've only lived in this day and age, so I can't really comment how it was 150 years ago, but it seems like we have a lot of distraction now as you guys don't need me to elaborate on. This is just a fact of our lives. And so whenever I'm trying to find ways to get past that, whether it's focusing myself in my own playing or in my listening or in my teaching, sometimes I find you have to kind of use some tricks to get around the part of our brain that likes to be constantly fed new entertainment. And so ways to maintain engagement, ways to maintain focus. Um, and sometimes it takes incorporating something beyond just the sheer um, experience at hand to get a little bit away from the chatter in our minds. So one way I do this is through kind of visualizing things. And I'm going to offer a few different ways of visualizing things as we listen to some stuff here. Um, so the first one is I like to think about what sound actually is. And so sound is basically compression waves in the air or in another material, if we were listening through water or we were listening through a piece of metal or something like that. But it's basically sound compression at different frequencies, different, different speeds of, of the ways that the air is compressed. That moves through the air, hits our eardrum, our ear vibrates, that creates a nervous signal and goes to our brain. And way more complicated things than I'm qualified to talk about. But I like to think about, like if I'm sitting there listening to the piano, and someone plays a chord on the piano, the hammers strike the strings and the strings are vibrating. And even though we don't see it, that there's air, there's air being compressed in waves that's coming off the strings, probably bouncing off the lid and heading out to us, and that we hear that. And so part of, sometimes to help myself concentrate on listening, I imagine what those waves would look like. What if there was some way we could create some kind of some kind of uh, optical dye that we could throw into the air like they do with MRI scans in our bodies where we could see that. And then the other thing I want to talk about in relation to that is overtones and how overtones work and how basically harmonics work. And on a real basic level, if we take any frequency and then we double it, that will be an octave. And then if we double that again, it'll be um, another octave. And if we double that again, it'll be another octave. And we can use other ratios smaller than that to create other intervals. And just to imagine what that would also look like as a part of it. So as an example, if I clap a steady rhythm, hopefully kind of sort of steady, that is, that is a note. Now it's going so slow, we don't actually hear it as a note. Like we just hear it as clapping, but it is a note of some kind. It's just a really, 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 really low frequency. It's like a super bass note the way I'm playing so low. This is the lowest someone could play. But then if I double that up, 
then that's an octave. And then if I play three over two, so if I, I got to do this on my lap, so that's a perfect fifth if I do it perfectly. And I don't mean it's like a perfect fifth. I mean, it is literally a perfect fifth. Like if you sped that up to a speed where say one hand was at 440 Hertz and the other hand was at whatever the other one would be <laughs> in relation to that. Is that 660? I'm not exactly sure. Then uh, that would be a perfect fifth and so on and so forth. If you do four against three. That's a major third. So in addition to kind of just visualizing the waves coming off, I imagine as we're hearing all these different chords and harmonies working together, what an amazing kaleidoscope of colors and different kinds of waveforms and shapes if you started mixing all those various sine waves at different speeds together are. So I don't know, maybe this is all just kind of new agey nonsense, but it gives me something to kind of view in my mind um, as I'm listening to something to get me a little bit out of the mindset of saying, oh, that's a major chord, oh, that's a minor chord, oh, that person articulates like Lester Young, oh, I that person's using a China symbol or whatever. So I have a little short bit of a track that I think is really nice listening for, for this kind of idea. It's got some strings and some really lush long chords. So see if you can just listen to this and envision if we could see all the waves coming off of these instruments, what they would look like and how they would interact with each other. And again, I'm, it's not that I think this is how we should analyze music or something like that. It's just a way to kind of focus on something to maybe resist the urge to pick up our phone or resist the urge to think about what I'm going to have for dinner or resist the urge to think about other things. It gives us kind of a, another layer of stuff to kind of just imagine and take in and don't judge it as good or bad or anything like that. It's just a sensation. It's just like the color blue. The color blue isn't good or bad. It's just a color. I'd like listening to that. I imagine like when the baritone saxophone comes in, like all the overtones in that sound, right? Jazz baritone saxophone is such a rich sound. And when you really are listening to it, you can hear all this rattling going on there and imagining what all those overtones stacking must be like. And of course, the very first entrance with all the lush chords is beautiful as well. And then when the rhythm section pops in for a second there, you get, you know, the high end symbols, like really filling out the top end of the sound and then beautiful bass note from Peter Washington down at the bottom, kind of filling, filling things in and a little bit of twinkling at the piano as well. So for me, like listening to especially a piece like that, really, I stay more engaged with that just through all the warmth and the beauty of, of what's going on. And I did kind of cherry pick a good a good track for that. But you could do it with things that are not quite so uh, so obvious for that kind of thing. Any, uh, I know you weren't listening for the song because we were talking about all this other stuff, but does anyone know what that tune is? That's super obscure. That is the theme to The Bad and the Beautiful, which is a film noir, uh, a film noir film. It's a piece of film noir from, I think, the late 50s, if I remember, or the mid 50s. And that's Gary Smolian on the baritone saxophone. I love that album because it's baritone saxophone and strings, which is not the first thing you think of for a, a strings album, but just lovely arrangements by Bob Belden. And it's really nice. And that's the very first track. It's just nice little two minute and 40 long, 40 second long track. Um, so now I want to do something really different. And then maybe we'll pause after this next one and, and if anyone has questions or comments. So another thing that can help me engage is I imagine I'm the person playing what I'm hearing. And this works really well for like the next thing I'm gonna play is solo piano. So it's really good for that. But things, this is where rhythm section players have the great advantage. Imagining I'm playing the drums, imagining I'm playing the bass, imagining I'm playing the piano. Um, and of course I can't play these things, but I just imagine like what it would feel like to sit there at the piano and try to get around the instrument like this next person's going to be able to and what joy that would bring. You could also just imagine yourself dancing to the music. You could imagine yourself just moving to the music. Um, I like to put on these like mid eighties Tom Waits albums before dinner in our living room and me and the kids will like, just like do these strange primitive walking around dances to the music, just like it's this very kind of weird childlike thing, but like really, again, embodying the music in some way to kind of get past this mental filter that's always trying to analyze everything and judge it. So check out this next track and imagine what it would feel like to play this. 
plus it's just awesome but imagine what it would be like to play this Wow. So imagine what it would feel like to be able to play that. And I, and I say be able to play that, and that implies some kind of like, oh, I'm so great, I can play it. I just mean literally imagine what it would feel like to play that. Sitting at the piano and being able to let go to that point where you could just let your hands fly like that. And what would the keys feel like under your fingers? What, would your, what, what kind of like muscle memory would you have to have? What kind of flow would you have to feel in your body to be able to do something like that at those kind of tempos? with that kind of ease, with that kind of joy. That's the great Art Tatum, who was probably an alien, you know, because I don't know how humans play like that. Um, I love Art Tatum. He's, I mean, I, I sometimes forget about him, but every time I put him on, I'm like, God, this, this is like, this is some of the most amazing music that's ever been put on record. And uh, there's a, a some Art Tatum on YouTube, but there's one in particular called, uh, well, it's not called, it's the tune Yesterdays. And it's most, most Art Tatum on uh, video or, you know, film, whatever, uh, is a lot of it's ADR, meaning it's not, the audio wasn't recorded at the same time that the film was recorded. But I'm pretty sure that track of Yesterdays is, and it's definitely worth seeking out if you want to just be amazed at what a human can do but even beyond like looking at the athleticism of it or looking at like the um, that it's impressive just it's really easy for me to stay engaged listening to that because i just am getting i can like feel like those ivories under my fingers as i play not able to actually do what he does but it's it's so palpable it's very it's there's such a strong texture to everything going on and when he goes up to the high note and hits plink oh it's so great i really like it very much and it's such a dumb tune, T for two, but I really do like that song very much. Every time I hear it, I'm like, this is a really good song. It's a really good song, a really good structure. Jazz, the jazz professors and he's like, this is a good, it's a good form. It's a good structure. I like the way they modulate in the second and eight bars. And then at the end, they go to the other thing and come back. It's really, really well thought out. Very good tune. But sometimes to try to shut that off, that's when I try to go with these other things. So what do you all think? I mean, it, the problem with the Zoom thing is, I am totally capable of blathering on for a long time. So I want to, I want to like open up the floor here for a second before I play something else. And, and uh, if you have any questions or any thoughts or anything you want to share, anything you're noticing while you're listening, is it the Zoom reticence? That, that was fun. It's been a while since I've heard some Art Tatum. And that was yeah. like a really good thing to, to put on right now. Yeah. <laughs> And, really and, and, he was, and he was blind. And he, was he was blind. blind. Yeah. Yes. So he's just feeling his way around there. You know. Yeah. He was. He. <laughs> he, knew, he had a lot of confidence. That Art Tatum had a lot of confidence. Like uh, the other great thing about Art Tatum is he recorded a lot. Like some of some folks, we don't have as many recordings as we wish we did. But he recorded a ton. Like so, I don't even know how many. I don't even know which version of T for Two that is. I just was looking through Art Tatum today, and I came across that one. It seemed good, but I, I'm sure there's about a half dozen other good T for Twos as well. Uh, there's also some great group sessions he did with Ben Webster. Um, I can't remember who else is in the band. Red Calendar. Um, it'll, it'll come back to me later, but yeah, just amazing amazing musician um yeah yeah and a lot of fun it's hard not to be happy when you hear art tatum if, if you if you're not being happy you're just not really listening um okay so now i want to play another version of t for two and i invite you to listen to this however you want you could listen to it you know envisioning what 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 does what do the sound waves come off in our imaginary optical die bouncing off these instruments to keep us focused you could imagine what it would feel like to play any of these instruments or to sing this the vocal part um but i, I i'm asking you to try another thing and this is a little tricky because it's easy to kind of go off into your own little world when you do this but especially when there's vocals and lyrics involved Sometimes I, I just kind of check in on how I'm feeling emotionally while I'm listening to it. It's a little tricky because you don't want to go down the rabbit hole like of like you start thinking about emotions and then all of a sudden you're concerned about your bank account or something like that, you know, because you, you it's easy to start going down that path of things. But if you can kind of sense what you're feeling listening to your internal radio 
but also kind of just let it go and see, okay, now two bars later, what am I feeling? Two bars later, what am I feeling? Two bars later, what am I feeling? And it doesn't even have, you don't need to put words to it either. Like it doesn't have to be like, I can identify this feeling based on, you know, these criteria, but just notice what's going on in here. Because hopefully, ultimately, art moves us in some way as people, not just as kind of intellectual beings. So check this out. Now, I today I tried not to just go and find my favorite things of all time. I tried to find things that I thought were good, but that were maybe a little different. And this was actually a track I heard for the first time today, but I thought it works pretty well for this. So like I said, that's probably only like the third time I've heard that or something like that. Because I was trying to look for, I was trying to look for some things today I didn't know like super, super well. What what do, what do you think or feel about that? I'm just curious. Nothing. It's just like Zoom reticence. No one wants to be the first I, one to jump I, in. On I Zoom. like I, I like when when you do a ballad like that, and it's just one time through. Yes, mm, it's yeah. very, really cool. It's like there was so much expressed just one time through. Yes, it was it, like an alert, like a whole story. Yes, and you're just waiting for the next line. And, but in the meantime, you know, it's just, it's just, the tenor guy is just very festive, you know. And I, I was just like, yeah, it was really cool. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And yeah, you, I, yeah. I, yeah, I love that. Um, that was that Rebecca Martin. It is Rebecca right? Martin. Yeah, yeah. With Larry Grenadier and uh, and Bill. Is that Bill McHenry on tenor? It's not. So that's no. uh, that. That is a trio, right? I that's think that, yeah, yeah. I think um, so. I was curious if that was. It is Larry Grenadier and it's Rebecca Martin, but it's actually a Paul Motion album. Oh it's wow! It's on Broadway Volume Four, also called The Paradox okay. of Continuity. Um, wow. And most of the album is just Paul Motion, Larry Grenadier, and Rebecca Martin, and that's actually Chris Potter on tenor that's saxophone. That's Chris Potter. Wow. Which I just laugh because I it's him. I. I mean, I hear the, I'm like, okay, I know that's Chris Potter, but oh, I only know it because of really specific saxophone things, like some intonation things and stuff like that. And so that's why I just started laughing. It's like so goofy in a really wonderful, like joyful way, like Paul said, like it, like he goes up for some high, goofy, like drunken, romantic kind of thing. It just makes me crack up every time I've heard it so far. Yeah, um, I would have never thought Chris Potter. Yeah, no, yeah, not in a million either. years. No. Right? That first entrance is just like, blah, blah, blah. it's so great. Um, and then on some tracks on this album is this Japanese pianist who's since passed away, uh, it's like Masa, Masabumi Kamuchi, or I'll, I'll look it up so, and maybe I'll send it to folks who are interested, who's very, like very strange pianist. It's a, it's, and those tracks are, are weirder. Um, I don't need, I don't, and I'm not sure Rebecca Martin's actually on those tracks. I think those, those three or four might just be, uh, just be, uh, uh, the, the instrumentals at that point. But most of the album is Rebecca Martin, Chris Potter, Larry Grenadier and, and Paul Motion. It's great. They do, they do, uh, Brother Can You Spare a Dime, which I love that song. It's such a great song. That's a shanty in an old shanty town. It's all these old tunes with Paul Motion playing like Paul Motion and Chris Potter trying to figure out how to like fit in in the, in, in the middle of all this stuff. It's really, really great. I, I really enjoyed it. And it's recorded, I mean, not to get back to last week's topic, but it's also recorded amazingly well. Like if you're listening to it on good headphones, like the stereo mix is fantastic. And Chris Potter is a little further away from the microphone than normal, than a saxophone player normally would be. So you get a lot of air in the sound and it, you hear a lot more of what it actually sounds like. It's really kind of nice. For me, emotionally, I like that track, though, because it feels like you're never sure they're going to get to the next beat on time. Like there's this constant feeling of like, OK, we, we made it. OK, we made it to the next one as well. All right. And I just love that off kilter. This there's some part of me emotionally that likes the idea of like really end of the gig, late night ballad playing for three people, you know, um, I like those moments on gigs. I miss that. I miss that. Pandemic has taken away my barfly moments of my <laughs> gigs. Um, but anyway, so being able to, and then it was also very funny, you know, so it was like these moments of like kind of holding back, kind of not sure, not sure footedness, the opposite, the opposite of Art Tatum. <laughs> and then uh, mixed with this kind of humor. I find it very funny. And I like hearing all the lyrics, you know, I love the part, you know, um, the line about getting away from the city and then I can picture like the couple in the woods and 
you know, I, I don't know. There's just a lot of things in that tune I, I like in that track. Um, okay, how about something wildly different now? Um, and again, you can listen to this however you want. You can listen to it. Um, well, first of all, you can always listen to it however you want. But if you want to try any of these things, you can do that. Or another one for this one is really good because this is a, a composer and a band where things are really layered. And you'll notice that right away. So you sometimes for music like this, I, I was like to being in recording studios where you can watch the tracks coming across the screen from left to right. Sometimes they even put different colors on them and you can see the waveforms on them. So almost imagine something like that while you listen to this to kind of help with engagement. Now this I'm curious if anybody will know, but okay, here it comes. So what do you think of that? Before you, before I get what you think of it, could you see how that there's lots of layers to that music, right? Everybody's kind of got a very specific part they're playing and then they come in and out at different times. So for me, when especially music can be a little like that is a lot more challenging than something like a standard like T for two. So having something maybe to grab hold of in my mind of like, oh, let me check out this layer for a little while. Oh, let me go over. Oh, there's a piano player. He's playing. It's in my right ear. He's playing this part over here. It kind of repeats there. Let me check that up for a little bit. Oh, OK, now I'll jump up back. Oh, the saxophone players are back in. So kind of being able to kind of almost in my mind, see the way the different parts are being put together. But what do you guys think? Does anyone know who that was? I don't. It kind of reminds me of um, a little bit of like some of Dave Holland's writing. Oh, like that's that, a, where it's like that's very, a very interesting observation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was cool. Like I, I found my ears yeah. just kind of bouncing around from the different yes. layers. Like I would kind of go down to the bass and hang out there yeah. for a little bit. And then I'd listen to the saxophone blend. And um, yeah, it was, it was pretty wild. I really loved, I loved it. It, it, it is like Steve Coleman. Maybe? It is Steve Coleman. It's it's, it's, it's Steve Coleman and Five Elements. Okay. Uh, that's cool. from an album called Black Science from 1991. Um, and Dave Coleman, uh, not Dave Coleman. Dave, Dave Coleman's a drummer. Dave Holland um, is actually uh, on that album, not on oh. that track. Not on that track. Okay. And and so uh, Steve Coleman is a Chicago bass saxophone player. Um, and and he had his uh, Paul mentioned M bass, which was kind of his philosophy, or is his philosophy he's still alive and records still. Uh, M bass stands for macro basic array of spontaneous and extemporization. I think I think that's right. Um, but it's not his music, especially tracks like that. Not literally every track, but especially tracks like that. Not really based in tertial harmony, first of all. So you can't really analyze it in terms of our standard kind of chords. It's based much more on kind of intervallic structures and how they work together. But the main element of his music over and over again is rhythmic layers on top of each other. Um, and as opposed to what Dave Holland would do with with these ideas, because Dave Holland played with Steve Coleman. There's a great uh, Dave Holland ECM called album called Extensions, which is kind of like a Steve Coleman album with Dave Holland playing bass. It's like Smitty Smith and the guitar playing Eubanks, Kevin Eubanks and uh, Steve Coleman and Dave Holland. Um, and then it, over time, Dave Holland kind of takes some of those ideas and streamlines them into something a little more uh, I hate to say commercially viable when we talk about jazz, but it is a little more accessible. Maybe that's a better way to put it um, with the quintets with, with Chris Potter and, and Robin Eubanks. How commercially viable is like playing in nine all night? And seven <laughs> five, where you know, that's why I, I said that, that, ter that word is probably not the right way to put it. It's all um, relative. <laughs> it's all relative. But with Steve Coleman's music, those each part is in its own time signature. And it's more like gamelan music where it only works out every so often. So it's not like not everybody's playing in the same odd meter. Some people are playing in three eight, some people are playing at four four. And that's why they all have very specific parts. If you ever see a Steve Coleman score, often even the drum part is written out that he's playing, like where he's playing the cowbell in specific spots is written out in that very pat specific pattern so that it lines up in a certain way with that bass pattern. So often the only improvised parts are the soloists, like when Steve Coleman's playing his solo over the top of it. Not every Steve Coleman tune is like that, but in this particular era, a lot of them are like that. But a lot of folks got their start in his bands. Greg Osby, because mm -hmm. there's multiple recordings with both of them together. 
Cassandra Wilson, whose music is nothing like that now, but she got her start singing with Steve Coleman. Uh, Marvin Smitty Smith, Kevin Eubanks, Robin Eubanks, um, someone else famous, I'm forgetting. It'll come to me later. But yeah, bit, actually a pretty, pretty significant musical figure in the early 90s, late 80s into the early 90s. Yeah. Was, was Charnette Moffat in there? In the, in... Not, on that, not on that album. He's probably on something else, though. Um, I forget who's all on this album. I looked earlier today. Um, the only names I really recognize were Dave Holland on some of those tracks and Smitty and Marvin Smitty Smith's the drummer. Well, I, was, I was just talking about all those all those cats. Oh yeah, sure. Out, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That bag. And actually, weirdly, there's also like a Steve Coleman album with like Vaughn Freeman on it, playing like where they play some music like what we just heard, and then they'll play like a swinging standard type tune, like maybe not a standard, it's original, but something more like that with Von Freeman, because Von Freeman was a famous Chicago saxophone player that that Steve Coleman loved, you know, like Brad Brad loves too, you know. So it's this weird combination of like super, like avant-garde fusion music mixed with like Von Freeman playing kind of out swing music. Uh, it's very interesting. And then and then this English bass player, Dave Holland, who played with Miles Davis, somehow gets dropped into the middle of all this and and is very influential in all that as well. Um, I do have, I know we're almost out of time. I have one more track I just wanted to play because uh, I love it. This one is one I love. And I thought, you know, I want to play something that I'm pretty sure you haven't heard and that offers a wide variety of ways to listen taking any of these things. You can listen to it kind of on an emotional level. You can listen to lots of different layers we're going to have here. You can listen to it just through the sheer kind of harmonic overtones that are going to ring off this thing. Um, you can imagine yourself playing some of these instruments or singing some of these parts. Um, I, I don't know if you know this, so I, and, and, and since we're probably going to run out of time, uh, but this is from a Django Bates album. So Django Bates is an English composer, pianist, he plays also some kind of uh, brass horn. I forget the exact model. It's like an alto horn or something like that. Um, but he's mostly a composer. And he writes these kind of large scale things for bands. It's fairly complicated music. And this is from an album called uh, Summer Fruits and Unrest. And this track is Sad Africa. And the first time I heard this, I was just like kind of, I just had to kind of stop and listen to the whole thing. So I hope you enjoy. It's about six minutes long, but I think you kind of got to get back to the end to kind of hear all the parts of it. And then we'll probably have to wrap up after that, I'm, I'm guessing. So so here's here's one more track for your evening to send you off with some new ear food. Yeah, so that's that. That's the thing. Um, unfortunately, that album's kind of hard to find, but it is really, really quite great. It's pretty wild music. I mean, and he seems like a pretty interesting character. I've been trying to learn a little more about him. Unfortunately, it's he recorded a few really great albums for JMT, and they've never been reissued, and they're not streaming anywhere. Um, so they're they're one of these weird things in this day and age. You actually kind of have to seek out and find on a like a secondhand market. Uh, there's a really good one that Brad Good played for me. Um, it's after this album, it's called Winter, Winter's Hearts and something, something, but it's got this crazy version of, of New York, New York on it, where it's like changing style every eight bars. And I remember Brad showing it to me and it's just, it's just pretty wild. I mean, I don't know if it's music I want to listen to every day, but it does, it definitely opens up my ears in ways that, and it makes me remember things again, like, wow, music is wonderful and fascinating and wild and mystic and all these things that uh that it's easy to forget you know sometimes i i just said to said to a student the other day man i wish i could hear john coltrane again for the very first time and can i sit and try to imagine as i listen to an album like that i'm not listening to john coltrane that i'm just listening to this sound i've never heard before and what would that be like like i didn't even know what saxophone sounded like what would that be like i just i miss those moments and you can kind of get close to it, but it's hard again. You know, I wish I could see eight and a half again for the first time. I wish I could see a fistful of dollars again for the first time, you know, all these things. So anyway, it's, it, that, that hopefully is a little fun. I was thinking for next week, maybe I'll uh, play some more kind of traditional jazz things, but maybe listen to the way 
I've been really digging lately listening to the way different rhythm sections deal with playing behind horn players and the, the, the kind of myriad of ways that one can do that. And not looking for specific, like, they play this chord here and they use this key over here, but maybe more just like, what's the character, what's their, what's the philosophy they're going for? What's their aesthetic they're trying to get across here? And how does it work? Does it work well on this tune? Would it work well on any tune? Does it, um, is it very specific to that era? I thought that might be fun. I was listening to some of, of the Miles album, uh, My Funny Valentine, which is part of the complete concert from 1964. And I was just thinking about patience like Herbie and Ron and Tony are so patient on that album. And then I th just try and think, okay, now let me find something where they're not patient and we could kind of compare those things. Anyway, so maybe we'll do that next week if that's cool with everybody. And this is, this is awesome, Peter. I, I really dug that last thing. Um, really reminded me a lot of Jocko's big band in, in yeah. a lot of ways, you know, so in, in, instrumentation wise, you kind of hear some of the same things like Piccolo is coming out and yeah. doing funny stuff. And, but and also a kind, kind of, of wild looseness, but also very dense. Yeah. You know, so it's, 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 it, and a lot of it is pretty carefully written. When it gets to the soli in the middle of the part that's actually kind of in time in the middle, like that solely yeah. goes on a long time. And there's all these other kind of solo parts around it, but there's a lot of detail there, which I like. I'm like, that's like, I'm a detail oh, junkie. Yes. So like, that's, that's like fun for me. But um, yeah, it's pretty cool. I like oh, that thanks track. for thanks for uh, hipping us onto that. Yeah. yeah, and then you're very welcome. Uh, who who was it? Who, like, what was the name of that group then? So it's it's the album is a Django Bates album, and the Django album Bates. is called Summer Fruits and Unrest, and oh, Unrest. Nice. Um, and like I was telling these guys, you probably have to try to find it on CD because I haven't been able to find it streaming anywhere. Um, I didn't look, I guess I didn't look to see if you could buy it as a download. I guess I, I guess I didn't check that. So you might be able to just purchase it that way too. Um, and every track is, is pretty different from the last track. You know, it's, it's like a pretty big collage of stuff on that recording. It's a large group and it's all British musicians who I don't know. I don't recognize hardly any of the names, you know. Yeah, man, that choir in there is just really wild. Yeah, that's the yeah. musicians. That is the yeah. band. Like, yeah. so they, that all the folks who are playing the instruments, they just put down their instruments and sing that part and then they put their instruments back up. Singing. But when the choir first comes in, it's shocking. Like, it, and in a good way. I mean, it just is like, what is that sound? I, yeah. And that's, that's really cool, you know. And I like that the bass line, it's like, it wasn't enough to have bass clarinet playing it. It wasn't enough to have tuba playing it. We also had to get the bass player playing it. So for like for like four minutes, you get bass clarinet and tuba and bass bass player all playing electric bass playing the same bass line, and it somehow works. It doesn't get old. I don't know. I kind of it's fascinating to me. I kind of dig it. Um, I look forward very much to seeing everyone next week.